Okay. All right, so let's get started. Welcome everybody to our panel on the Teamsters and the UAW. Sorry, I disappeared for a second. Uh, you know, Zoom, it's a beautiful thing. Um, my name is Jonah Furman. I am a staff writer and organizer for Labor Notes. If you're not familiar with Labor Notes, we're a media and organizing project. Uh, we say we're putting the movement back in the labor movement. We try to connect people across unions on a rank and file member level, learn from one another, tell each other stories uh, and organize together. So in that spirit, we have a panel tonight that's going to feature leaders and activists in the uh, movements to transform the United Auto Workers Union and the Teamsters Union. And we have some amazing speakers tonight. Uh, I'm honored to be on a call with them. Um, people who have been active in this movement for decades, people who are uh, still working on the shop floor and organizing today. Uh, and just to set the stage, we're in the midst of two historic votes in these unions, which is why we wanted to have this panel. One in the United Auto Workers is a referendum on changing how top leaders are elected through a direct voting system, moving away from a delegate election system. And we'll hear all about why that's so important. And another is an election of the top officers in the Teamsters Union to elect new leadership after 23 years of James P. Hoffa running that union. So I'm going to kick it to each of our panelists, and we'll hear just for one minute on you know who they are, how they came to the movement, what they do today. Um, and we can start with our Teamster side. Uh, Ken, if you want to start us off. OK, good evening. Um, well, I have a long history with the Teamsters Union and the insurgent reform movement within it, Teamsters for Democratic Union, TDU. After working for a, uh, as a truck driver in the 1970s in Cleveland, Ohio, Local 407, I, uh, I started working full-time for the reform movement, TDU, as our first uh, staff person. Later, I became the national organizer. We have a small staff that has grown a bit. And uh, I stepped down from that position just recently, weeks ago. I'm on the national board, our, our national steering committee of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. And with us today is Sister Carthy Boston, who is a brand new member of our national board. We, so we have a long history. We're a durable rank and file uh, movement. That's what we call ourselves. We don't call ourselves a caucus in uh, 1.3 million member Teamsters. It's a good union to be in because it's potentially the most powerful union with the, in the logistics, transport and distribution industries. Uh, we know how strategic they are. Over that long period, we've had our share of defeats and we've had some, some good victories. One I wanna just mention at the start is we won the right, what we call the right to vote. In the UAW, they call it one member, one vote where you directly elect the international officers rather than having the local officers go to a convention every few years. And in the Teamsters, it's every five years. That's the maximum allowed by law. So naturally they landed on that. And uh, we have a direct election now, which is going on right now in our union. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, and yeah, Carthy, uh, tell us what you do, how you came to this call and to this movement. Thanks, Jonah. Good evening. Carthy Boston out of Washington, D.C. Um, pretty much I'm a Teamster. Uh, I would say a 15-year Teamster um, with UPS. I started out at Local 177 in Jersey and then transferred into Local 639 also and now in the D.C. area. I actually worked um, on the preload. I'm now a preload shop steward. I'm also involved in TDU aggressively on the ground, pretty much getting involved in the campaign. As Ken just alluded to, I was just elected to the International Steering Committee. And as you know, TDU is pretty a pretty aggressive grassroots organization, pretty much vaulted in various capacities. I would say I'm across the country trying to get people out to vote currently. If you ask me what I'm doing now is trying to mobilize the vote. And we're at a critical turning point in the union standpoint to get people to vote. Um, there's a lot of mistrust going on on the ground. And, trying to just mobilize that. So I've been doing a lot of underground movement, giving up my vacation time, my, my days, to actually get into different locations to mobilize the vote on the ground. So I would say pretty much widespread at the moment. Thanks, Carthy. Um, now let's uh, let's move to the UAW side of things. Um, Mike, you wanna start us off? 
Yeah, my name is uh, Mike Cannon. I'm a retired international representative with the United Auto Workers Union uh, out of St. Louis. Um, I joined the UAW in 1970, so I've been a dues paying member for 51 years now. And I'm a member of uh, UAW Local 282, a small amalgamated local union in the St. Louis, Missouri area. Uh, I held a number of positions in the UAW on the local level, steward, committeeman, and chairman in my local plant for nine years. And then I was appointed to the UAW International Staff and I worked as a servicing representative in the St. Louis area predominantly um, for 24 years, uh, negotiating contracts and also arbitrating grievances. Um, I was a member of the UAW New Directions Movement in the 1980s and 70s. And uh, I served as an assistant to Jerry Tucker, who was one of the uh, founders and uh, regional director uh, in the UAW. Uh, now I am a member of the steering committee for UAWD, that's Unite All Workers for Democracy. Um, and I'm currently advocating for the passage of uh, one member, one vote, or what we call now on the ballot, the direct voting system. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and Scott, maybe you can tell us what you do in UAWD and where you work and how you're organizing today. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanna say thank you for having uh, having me on the panel and, and uh, you know, it's a great opportunity. Labor Notes has been, uh, you know, just an inspiration for uh, many of us activists in the labor movement. Uh, yeah, I work at uh, Ford Chicago Assembly Plan. I'm a member of UAW Local 551 for 32 years. Uh, I'm a rank and file uh, electrician. Uh, I've held some uh, uh, offices in my local union, uh, vice president, uh, secretary treasurer, and uh, uh, alternate committeeman. Uh, but uh, now uh, my role is uh, chair of the steering committee for Unite All Workers for Democracy, UAWD for short. And uh, we are right now in the uh, fight for the life of our union. Uh, the lifeblood of our union is its members, uh, but the members have been uh, pushed to the sidelines uh, in uh, recent decades. And it's time for UAW members to take our union back and take back control of it through a uh, direct voting system. Uh, that's what we're fighting for right now. And it's a historic moment in the, in the UAW that there will be uh, you know, plenty of uh, words written about this, this moment. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I just wanna make a note for everyone. You can type a question into the Q&A box that you see at the bottom. We're gonna have some time later on to take those. So if there's something that you particularly want to ask, just put it in there. We'll try to get to some questions near the end. Um, so now I just want to go a little deeper on each of these. You know, I think Scott's totally right. There's a historic moment in these two unions. Uh, and I want to set the stage for people who aren't deeply involved in, in these unions and what's happening, both how we got to these points and uh, what are people, what are members doing about it today? Why does it matter for them? So let's start again on the Teamster side. Ken, if you could just tell us what's going on in the Teamsters election, you know, what's what's what? How would you tell the story for someone who's not involved, and how how do we get here? What's the run up to this moment? Well, uh, the Teamsters, as I said, have we have direct election for international officers. Ballots were mailed to 1.3 million members uh, on October 4, and every member gets a vote. Uh, there are over 100,000 votes in Washington already that have been returned. The voting will end, uh, will close on November 15th and they'll start counting them by local union. We'll know the counts by local, the way you know the count by precinct in a, in a civil election. And it will take a few days to count it. So we're hoping before Thanksgiving we'll be, have a lot to be thankful for because we're, we do look to be winning the election. The election pits uh, uh, James Hoffa, not the real Hoffa, he died in 1975, but the, the junior Hoffa, who was born on third base, but still dreams that he hit a triple. He, uh, he's been the president for over 20 years and he, he has been able to win elections against us, give him his due. We, TDU was able to put up a formidable opposition 
and to raise critical issues and to combat two-tier agreements and so on, but we could not defeat him. Uh, five years ago, that started to change. These Teamsters United slate headed by Fred Zuckerman backed by TDU got 49% of the vote and won six positions. There are some regional positions. So we swept the ones in the South and the central region of the union. Didn't give these vice pres international vice presidents any power. Often didn't give them any jobs, but it signaled to the members, hey, this guy's days, days are numbered. He's finished. And there became a, a sort of an opening in the union at that time. Furthermore, one of our things we organized at that time too was from vote no to vote them out. And vote no in the national agreements, Teamsters, majority of Teamsters are under local agreements, but a significant major, minority are under national agreements and trucking contracts, United Airlines, T-Force Freight, uh, yellow Freight and United Parcel Service, which is the largest labor agreement in the United States with 350,000 uh, Teamsters. In every single one, the members rejected the national agreement negotiated by the Hoffa administration. And at UPS, a majority rejected it, and then they imposed it anyway. They used a loophole in the Constitution, which they might have thought was a smart move, but that really was the last nail in the coffin in some ways. And uh, what happened was there was a break, a more militant teamster on the Hoffa team. Sean O'Brien broke with him uh, at, several years ago. By 2018, he was working with us in the Vote No movement and helped lead the Vote No movement. And that formed the new Teamsters United uh, slate, which is headed by Sean O'Brien and Fred Zuckerman. Uh, as I say, the voting is ongoing now. Carthy can say more about that. I would say that for TDU, our goal, we've been doing this for a long time. We believe in that we've succeeded in, in continuing and growing because we stick to principles, not personalities. We stay close with the members. We organize from the bottom up. And the election is very important, but even more important is what happens afterward. We feel it's an open door then for people to push up from below and build a new generation of leaders and a new direction in labor. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Karthi, maybe you could talk to us about what that means. Uh, what are you doing day to day around the vote? What's your activity like in detail? You know, tell, tell them about your trips, tell them about what the conversations are like and what your coworkers think of this stuff. Oh, you muted, sorry. There's well, the trips are pretty exciting if I might start about that. Um, well, the trips across the country have gathered a lot of things. Um, people are excited about the vote. They always knew about the vote. When we got to plants, facilities, wherever we went, they always knew that there was a vote coming up. Um, however, there was a lot of, Ken alluded to, there was a lot of blowback as it relates to the two-third vote. So for those of you who don't know what the two-third vote is, again, that was the loophole that passed the contract the last time when members voted it down. So when we got to a lot of the facilities, members were like, why should I vote? Why, why should I vote this time? I trusted you. It's, a, it's an act of betrayal that we voted and we didn't get what we voted for. So I think when we went to various facilities, it was trying to encourage people to vote that this time around that loophole has been closed because at the convention that was changed and that was voted again to, to change that rule. All right. So there was a lot of discontent about members talking about that. And second, the discontent came about talking about the contracts. For example, the 22-4s, a lot of the members talked about that. For those of you who don't know what the 22-4s, it's sort of a two-tier system of wages as well, a lower, lower form of driving at UPS, drivers at UPS, should I say. And members were discontented about that, saying that it's a divide and conquer situation with the union. So there was a lot of discontent about that. Across the country, again, the voters are, are out there. We're talking to them on a daily basis and text messaging. We've done text messaging banking on Saturdays and Sundays, um, calling people directly on their phones. I mean, it's a huge union, 1.3 million voters. So that's a lot of people to reach. So I think the ground campaign, boots on the ground is highly effective. I think if it's one thing that I gather from TDU is their ability to get people out there. I think all of us are actively engaged in, in being out at hubs, giving up our vacation time and showing our presence. And I think 
when we visited facilities, people were always saying, we wish we can see you guys all year. Were the union activists, were they? You know, so we realized the, the necessity to be out on the front line every single time when there's either an election or there's an important vote to be done. It's so important to show your face. Um, that has been happening. So we've been doing a whole lot of things besides just going to buildings, um, reaching out to members, carrying ballots every day. I mean, this morning I was out in a parking lot giving out um, flyers and, and reminding people if they didn't get their ballot, they should call the 1-800 number and what are the steps and how to vote and sort of directing people about how to go through that process because there might be change of addresses that have happened over the years and people have not updated the systems. So important to do that double checking to make sure that the vote count. So that has been going on and to again push that vote to get it count, to get that count, um, to get it counted because people hold on to their ballots, don't throw it in and absent-minded, just forget about it. So that's been critical. And as you know, the voter turnout might be a little bit low because people are discouraged from the last vote. And that was again, the pushback from the last time. So we really are doing you know, a great job to get out there to remind people, guess what? That loophole has now been plugged right. pretty much. Thanks, Carthy. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, Mike, tell us about the UAW. Maybe talk to us a little bit about, like Ken was talking about with Hoffa, talk about some of the concessions we've seen in the past, you know, 25 years and some of the corruption and how that led to this referendum. Well, you know, it's it's been a very dire situation in UAW as it relates to concessions. Um, you know, back in the, I go back 35 years, when doing New Direction, we, uh, we advocated a position where we should not get close to the corporation. We should not have joint programs with the corporations. Um, because that was going to, in effect, corrupt our union, and certainly it certainly did. Um, and it led us, it put us in a downward spiral uh, because of our close relations with the auto manufacturers in the United States. Uh, uh, we began to, uh, they began to chip away at our collective bargaining agreements. And now we are faced, we have in our agreements, you know, two tier, multi tier wage systems. Uh, we have, uh, different benefit tiers for workers based on when they are employed by the employer. Uh, so we've got in our auto plants, uh, two basic uh, contracts. I mean, it's one contract technically, but it, that one contract provides different levels of, of wages and benefits for workers. So, uh, you know, it's, and that certainly is not in the interest of, of uh, union members. Right, uh, because we're all supposed to be about unity and and, uh, and being uh, and representing each other and being a part of uh, of the uh, profits that uh, corporation makes. So uh, so that is the problem. Now, uh, where the corruption occurs uh, again, that cozy relationship with the automobile manufacturers led to uh, corruption on massive scale in the UAW on different fronts. Uh, to, and the individuals involved were 15 individuals, uh, three from uh, Chrysler Corporation, now it's the Landis Corporation, and uh, 12 UAW uh, top leaders, two UAW presidents, former presidents, three vice, former vice presidents, regional director, and a host of administrative assistants engaged in a, a multi-level corporate uh, corruption scheme in the UAW to defraud the membership to steal union dues, money, uh, and benefits. Um, luckily, it was, uh, it's been prosecuted by the uh, US De uh, Justice Department, and uh, all of those individuals are either serving time now or will be serving time. They have been sentenced and will serve that time uh, in, in prison for, uh, for the embezzlement and the, uh, and the fraud that they engaged in. Uh, but, you know, that whole um, bad, sad chapter in our history just brought forth the need to make a big change in the UAW. Uh, before, we used the convention delegate system to elect uh, a top leadership of the union, and that system was controlled and has been controlled by the administration caucus for 70 years, 70 years, seven decades. Uh, 13 people basically decide who's going to occupy the top positions in the UAW. So because we created this system of entitlement 
uh, to these positions in the top leadership of the UAW, uh, these individuals felt comfortable enough that they could then steal money and not get caught because no one was going to uh, tell the government that they were stealing money. Um, and as a result of all of this, the cons a consent decree was agreed to between the UAW and US Department of Justice. And as a result of that, we have now uh, a referendum vote that's a creature of that consent decree, which gives the UAW membership and retirees the opportunity to vote on the question of how they want to elect the top leaders of their union. Uh, we can retain the convention delegate system, which in my opinion, only created the problem that we have with the corruption and concentrated power to the hands of just a few people to decide who would lead the UAW, or we could convert to the one member one vote or what we call on the ballot, the direct voting system, where every member will get an opportunity to cast a ballot in every election for the top leadership of the UAW so they can decide who will represent the UAW and its members uh, going forward. Uh, so that is what's going on in the UAW. Yesterday was a historic day for us, October 19th, the uh, referendum began, uh, ballots were mailed to the 1 million UAW members and retirees. And uh, that election will occur, uh, will actually end on November 29th. Uh, all ballots have to be in by November 29th at 10 a.m. by mail. And um, so that's, it's a historic moment for us. We have an opportunity to uh, instill or establish democracy in the UAW, something we've been fighting for in the UAW for 30 or 40 years. Uh, one other development that uh, I think we needs to be uh, talked about here tonight in the UAW is the fact that we now have 10,000 UAW members who work at John Deere on strike. They're fighting uh, for the contractual lives because they have a company that is uh, making exorbitant uh, profits and they came to the table and now they want concessions from the workers. And Scott can go more, I guess, in details on the issues there. But those are the two major events that are occurring in the UAW today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, we, we definitely will talk about Deer. Scott, you're welcome to elaborate a little bit on that. But I also want to hear, you know, specifically tell people, how are you going to win this referendum? How have you organized for the past? I mean, for it's been about two years, you guys have been working on this. So, um, you know, what are you doing to get this thing passed? Well, we've gotten a lot of uh, uh, inspiration from TDU. I can start start there. Uh, TDU uh, has shown us the way. They, they've been doing it for uh, uh, a number of decades, and, and we watched that. And we studied what uh, New Directions was doing. But uh, what we're doing in practice is we have to uh, build a list of UAW members to reach out to. And to do that, we've used a, a variety of techniques uh, from flyering with a scan code on it for people to uh, scan and uh, fill out a form so that we can have their contact information so we can exchange information with them. Uh, and you know, let them know when, when there's uh, changes on the ground that uh, are gonna affect them. Uh, so that's one, one way. Also, we've been doing text banking. Uh, we've been doing uh, some phone banking. Once we get the, the people on the list, we uh, uh, call them and see if they wanna uh, help out in any way, whether it's uh, text banking or, or doing or flyering. Uh, just this week, I've mailed uh, about 5,000 flyers out uh, just to people all around the country. And I've also placed orders for flyers in, in uh, Louisville, Detroit, and Kansas City. So, you know, we're, we're doing uh, what we can to build our list and get those members activated and, and working uh, to reclaim their union. Uh, like Mike said, this has been a 70-year uh, one-party rule in the UAW. And it's long time, long past time for a change. There's been uh, several attempts to uh, change to a direct voting system within the structure of the UAW, but it gets blocked every time it, it uh, tries to get uh, people try to get it put on the agenda for the Constitutional Convention. 
So, uh, you know, they, they control the uh, convention committee and won't allow uh, that to even come up in the uh, in the conventions, even though the members uh, put resolutions uh, for that in uh, in for the convention every every time uh, there's a convention. So now the members are going to get to uh, uh, have their voice heard for once, uh, and uh, they're not going to have to rely on the, their their uh, delegate to vote for them. They're going to get to vote for themselves to decide whether they want to uh, have a more democratic union. And uh, what Mike was saying about concessions, uh, I, I think that's uh, been the crux of, of the problem. One of the biggest, to me, the most egregious part of the corruption scandal is the bribes that were exchanged at the Fiat Chrysler. Uh, because we had vice presidents that were taking bribes, getting their houses paid off so that the uh, that Fiat Chrysler could get better contract terms and better enforcement terms during the contract. Uh, that cost uh, you know, the membership of the UAW hundreds of millions of dollars in, in uh, you know, lost wages, uh, lost grievances. Um, it, it's just... Uh, I, I just can't describe how awful that is uh, for the membership of the UAW. Uh, and now, uh, you know, even after uh, all of this has come out, uh, when Volvo workers went on strike, they voted their contract down by 90%. And uh, Ray Curry was the, the chief negotiator in that, that contract negotiation. He just kept bringing that contract back to them to re-vote on until they got it right. After the fourth time, it finally passed uh, by uh, a handful of votes. Uh, but that's that's not uh, negotiating on behalf of your members. And right now, the deer workers are facing the very same issue. Uh, they voted their contract down by 90% and said, we're willing to fight for what we deserve. Uh, this is a company that's making huge profits and we deserve uh, better. And actually the, uh, the tiered wage and benefit structure started with deer workers uh, since uh, they've had the tiers since 97. Uh, that was a, a, a full decade before it entered the, uh, you know, fully entered the auto industry. Um, so these, the corruption I think is, is really, you can really base it back to the joint programs because these joint programs create these huge slush funds uh, that are opaque. They're, the members don't know how much is in there, what it's going for, or anything like that. There's no LM2 for that where you can go look it up and see how money's being spent. Uh, so these, these pots of money have proven to be too tempting uh, for the, uh, the officers of the UAW uh, to keep their hands out of. And it's been too tempting for the companies. It's been a, well, I, I think it was their intention in the first place was to use these uh, uh, slush funds to uh, try and influence the uh, contract negotiations. So that's been the crux of the problem to me. Great, thanks, Scott. Yeah, um, I wanna just make one note here. We do have a Q&A box that some people have used, but I wanna make sure everyone's aware of it. If you do wanna ask a question, that's the best way for us to see it. And also, uh, because Zoom is funny, a lot of people have my name in the, in, in the Zoom. So if you wanna change your name, if you can, uh, just be interested to see who's asking these questions. But um, yeah, let's. Um, I wanted to open it up to at least one question for the whole panel to kind of discuss together. And, and you kind of touched on this, Scott, and, and to me, it's kind of about the deer strike and it's kind of about the last UPS contract. These are the types of things that motivate, you know, rank and file members who aren't super involved in the leadership of their union or the structures of their union. So part of my question is, what would it mean if these reform efforts won? For someone who's not already really committed to, you know, I care who's on my executive board or, you know, wh why do you think this is a path? Why do you spend your time after work working on UAWD and Teamsters for a Democratic Union? And why do you, you know, what do you say to members who, who want to know how does this affect 
the bottom line, concessions, corruption, democracy in your union. And that's open to anyone on the panel who feels, you know, they want to jump in on that. Well, I'll, I'll take it. I'll start off with it. Uh, in our case, the UAW, um, if we're, if, when we went, win the referendum, we strongly believe that it will, of course, end the stranglehold that the administration caucus has on the top seats of the UAW. Uh, and we're talking about the UAW International Executive Board here. here. Um, because what will happen is, same as what's current in TDU or in Teamsters, we will be able to field candidates for those top offices of the UAW. And, you know, there will be a debate that occurs as a result of that. Uh, you know, and those candidates will be questioned and their position on the issues as it relates to corruption or concessions or what have you are all going to be put out for the voters, the 1 million UAW members and retirees to vote on. So it will be for the UAW a dramatic change in how we select our members. Um, it will give us a chance to look over people and decide for ourselves who we want to run our union. Uh, also, it will create an environment where it will absolutely reduce or eliminate corruption because if we can get seats on the International Executive Board, we will be watching the other officers or top leaders of the International Executive Board and what they do. And because we have eyes on them, they are not going to be inclined to steal union dues money uh, for their own purposes. Um, so it, it adds an element of accountability, a big element of accountability that we don't currently have under the, uh, under the current uh, convention delegate system. So we pick up you know, the accountability. And then we also have an opportunity to advocate for a progressive path in terms of representing the interests of union members on the International Executive Board. We have a chance to try to influence and shape policy. And right now in the UAW, we have none of that. Yeah. We have no voice, no input whatsoever. Basically the 13 members of the administration caucus, they decide what's going to happen in deer negotiations or right. auto negotiations and, and that's it. But we can create a debate once we're able to gain seats on the International Executive Board. So yeah. it will radically change how we do business in the UAW. Thanks, Mike. Ken, did you, I saw your hand. You want to jump in? Well, I think um, as Carthy said, a lot of members are discouraged. Participation is low in union elections, including ours right now you know, percentage wise. I mean, it's gonna be hundreds of thousands of people, but it's it's not half the members. And, um, you know, I think having a, a leadership that at least opens the door, that stands shoulder to shoulder with people when they're ready to fight, it starts to inspire people uh, about the union, both in the union and beyond in other unions and, and unorganized people. One of the questions, in the chat was about organizing Amazon. Every time I talk to people outside of Teamsters, they want to know about organizing Amazon. All the candidates in this in the Teamster election say, oh yeah, we're going to organize Amazon. Well, I'll tell you what, they can't hire enough organizers to organize Amazon. The entire treasury could be spent on hiring them. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen when there's more of a movement. When people from Amazon start saying, hey, I want to get in that union, they just kicked UPS's ass and raised the wages for the for the inside workers by $6 an hour, and they're making a lot more than I am, and they seem to be happy about it. Then you start generating where you're organizing meshes with a broader movement. And I think that has to be our bigger goal for, for Teamsters and auto workers and others. These are good starting places, the Teamsters in the logistics, the auto workers in manufacturing. But we need to, we need to think big vision long term. And I think that's that's what can really start to inspire people uh, about unions and the labor movement and yeah. take unions off the defensive and onto the offensive. Right. Karthi, does that seem, does that ring true to you for talking to members at work? You know, do they make, connect the dots of, we have this election, it's going to open some path um, that could make this union come back or stronger or make life on the job better? 
Absolutely. I mean, this is pretty much the turning point of the union. People are looking at this as the last big vote that we had when, when Hoffer joined. I mean, it's now or never, pretty much members are saying. It's either we get on a train of the movement that's happening across the country, everyone is sort of mobilizing whether or not it's the wage, whether or not it's the wage crisis, whether or not it's corporate not being able to attract employees, whatever it is, people are saying it's the now or never movement. It's either we get on board now. Whoever wins is a pivotal turning point in the union, meaning it's either we're gonna get someone that's cushy cushy with management or we're gonna get someone that's adversarial. So, I mean, people are very, very eyes on on what's happening when it comes down to this vote. Um, embracing a leader, I mean, the fish rots from its head. So pretty much not having a strong leader means we're not gonna be out there striking, we're not gonna be out there voting. And I think members are aware of that because they feel that the union has lost power over the years. And, and that's pretty much what's happening. There's a lot of dissent, there's a lot of right to work states, there's a lot of things that's happening that we have to push back on. So when it comes to that, I think members are really aware about what's going on and say, this is the changing point. It's either we get on board this movement and we make a pivotal change or it's never gonna happen for us. So I think, again, we're at the moment of change, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, uh, Scott, does this, uh, same question to you, you know, how do you connect this kind of direct voting thing to the members and what would it mean? I mean, do you think, it would change things like deer and how? Well, what it, what it would do is uh, require the candidates to uh, communicate with the members. Uh, right now, I, I can tell you that probably the vast majority of UAW members have no clue what the name of their president is. Uh, and that's because he's never had to go out and campaign and never had to say, hey, you know, look at me, you need to vote for me because I can uh, make your, your union better, better, I can help you to win better contracts. Uh, that doesn't happen in the UAW. It, it, you, you, go, you send delegates to a convention and, and they get uh, you know, arm twisted into uh, going along to get along. Otherwise, uh, you know, things could happen to your plan. Uh, so you know, that's, that's the difference between the uh, delegate system and the direct voting system is that uh, the, the candidates are going to have to go to the members and, and introduce themselves. At the very least, you got to introduce yourself, but then it's going to be a competition of ideas. And when, when you have a competition of ideas and workers are right now in this country, we're at a point where we want to build back what we've lost. Uh, we, we need to claw back a lot of what we've lost. And, uh, you know, we're just disgusted with the, the fact that we've been uh, on a, uh, you know, a, a 40, 50 year uh, downward turn. Uh, the UAW has lost 1.1 million members since uh, 1979. Uh, we're, we're down below 400,000 members now, active members. We have more retirees than we have active members. Uh, so uh, what this voting system is going to enable is a competition of ideas and also it'll, it'll uh, you know, force the membership or the uh, leadership to get behind the membership in these uh, uh, job actions rather than uh, try and suppress them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's a communications problem. The members don't know what they're, I mean, they know what they want to strike for, but they don't know what's on the, on the bargaining table because uh, there's a lack of communication during bargaining. There's a blackout. It doesn't have to be that way. They've decided to do it that way. So uh, that's one thing is, is it can open up communications. Uh, but the members are wanting to uh, build a better standard of living for themselves, their families, their coworkers, their communities. Uh, and we want to rebuild our communities. And to do that, we're going to have to take stands like the deer workers are taking right now. And uh, we need leadership that's going to be working with them and not a headwind against them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we've seen with the uh, Volvo contract was the leadership was a headwind to what the membership wanted. They were, they were pushing back, trying to prevent them from winning uh, what they wanted out of that contract. Mm -hmm. Something I think is really interesting trying to touch on, I'm going to take a few of these questions here and, and there's a lot of them. So I'm going to bundle some of them together. But something in the deer 
uh, vote, this 90% no vote that was really surprising covering it for labor notes was they had three days to get that together. There was not a 10 year vote no movement. There was you know, an alignment of forces. The question for a lot of deer workers now that I'm talking to is, you know, what do we do next? How do we, how do we keep this going? And I think both the UAWD and TDU examples, you know, there's a lot of moments, but there's also a movement that's created in these unions. So this is sort of Thomas's question. Uh, you know, how did you start organizing your movement within your union? Uh, Thomas is a brother from CWA in California. Um, so both the how and the why, what does it, what does it matter to have an organization? Why do you have a TDU and not just a 2021 election? Why do you have a UAWD and not just a referendum? Um, and why do you put work into that organization? And that can be for anybody. I mean, this is all four of you would be great on that. Well, I'll start by saying, um, TDU is sort of the mighty mouse, you know, we're out there fighting fires and starting things and that people don't even think about. Um, when you think about the reach of organizations, it's small, but it's mighty. You think about the reach, we're able to do things that people are not able to do. When you talk about maybe agents or business agents or people who are working in the union front who are busy with other things and handling members' crises and buildings and grievances, they, they probably don't have the spread for that. They don't have the time to, to reach that. And I think when you look at organizations like TDU being able to spread their wings and get people on the ground and mobilize people, that's great. Organizing is the strength of the organization. And I think if um, O'Brien was smart enough to, to figure that out, to join forces and say, guys, you guys are strong when it comes to organizing. So I think you got to utilize the strength of every organization. And I think maybe that's something, as, as Scott talked about, alluded to before, that you can take from TDU. I mean, building on people's strength and collaborating and say, guys, mm -hmm. we got to come together as one. We're, we're, in a, we're in a fight together pretty much. So mm -hmm. I think that's one thing we can take from it. Scott, I'll just add to this, this question. It's related. People are asking directly, you know, after the referendum, what's UAWD going to do to keep organizing? Same, same with TDU. But, uh, you know, what does the organization do after the event? Well, this will be our first uh, chance to do that after the event. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're uh, going to have to be organizing uh, for uh, getting fair uh, election processes put into place. Uh, you know, I'm assuming that we're going to win this referendum. Uh, I, I work, uh, you know, members, UAW members across the country work on this every day, day in and day out. And uh, we have a couple of uh, extraordinary organizers that, that uh, staff organizers that are helping us. Uh, with this. Uh, but after the re referendum, we're going to put forward a, a platform. We actually have a platform already that we've uh, put together. Uh, but the first part of that platform is, is passing the referendum. Then after that, it's going to be winning a, a fair election uh, system. And then after that, it's going to be uh, getting delegates elected to uh, pass the reforms that, that we need. It's not just electoral reforms. Uh, there's reforms that, uh, well, for instance, uh, one of my pet peeves is that the, before we raised the union dues uh, by a, a half an hour a month, um, there was no way for the, re, the strike fund to regenerate itself. Every single penny that went into it got kicked back out uh, between rebates and even the interest went into the uh, International General Fund. So we need to correct that and make a strike fund that's, that's self-sustaining. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to do uh, beyond the referendum. Uh, but right now, our, of course, our main focus is on the referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, to bring that uh, forward, uh, I, I think we're going to have to uh, support our brothers and sisters in the struggle. Uh, and, and we got to show that we're all in this together. And uh, towards that end, uh, UAWD has begun a GoFundMe campaign. And that GoFundMe campaign and, and, uh, has really taken off. And, and a lot of that, is, that credit is due to you, Jonah, uh, for helping get it, getting it uh, out, spread out there widely. But, uh, and we thank you for that. Uh, but right now, we've raised uh, almost $75,000 uh, to help uh, our brothers and sisters that that are in the struggle right now, taking the the brunt of the uh, uh, the tip of the spear, so to speak, of the labor movement right now, 
And we're going to use that to, to help them to, uh, you know, sustain uh, their uh, strike effort. And, uh, you know, every penny that we raise is, is going to go towards uh, helping our brothers and sisters to uh, stay out there until they get a, uh, the best contract that, that they uh, can. John, can I uh, can I cut in just a please, second? Please, please, yes. Uh, I think you said the the question you had was from a, a union member from CWA, and they wanted to know how can they get started, how how can they get a reform movement started in their union, and um, I, you know I I think the the best way to start it, and I've been a part of two reform movements now, the New Direction and now uh, UAWD, is to just start talking to people. Um, in your local, uh, outside, in your area, uh, anybody that you meet uh, in any meetings, uh, conventions or what have you, just start talking to people about the need to have um, a vehicle for change that exists in your union. Uh, without even a framework or anything official or formal, just start having those discussions. Um, and then use the tools that you have today the, 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 I am absolutely amazed at all the tools that exist today for organizing. I mean, you have Zoom, you have free conference calls. I mean, you have uh, email texting. If we had those tools back in the 80s when we were organizing for, for a new directions, I mean, we would have been hell on wheels. So you've got all these wonderful wonderful tools that you can use that will help you organize, pull people together, use those tools. Um, and that's exactly how UAWD got started. It was just a group of people started talking about the corruption. They were calling each other. And before you know, before you know it, they started saying, well, hey, let's talk every Saturday, you know, for an hour. Let's just kind of just keep this conversation going and look what it's grown into, right? So you've got that. And then what you want to do is you want to use your constitution. You want to follow the leadership closely. If they violate the constitution, try to pick an issue that you can win against them to help build support. Challenge them through the constitution um, and, and those means that you have to create a victory that will also give you some publicity with other members. And then you can build on that. So I think that's sort of like the pathway towards establishing a reform movement in uh, the union. And I guess Ken or yeah. uh, I, I, would, I, think. I would just add, when you talk about what's happening next for, I mean, for many of us, for me, the, the movement has already moved to the next level, which is focusing on the contract. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at the biggest contract that Teamster has under their wing, which would be UPS. That's for us. If we get a good contract, that's going to set the stage for a lot of things to come. So we really need to start focusing and getting in gear. And you know, when I when you look at the history of UPS, the first strike was what 1997. We haven't had a strike since that was the only national strike UPS ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think both of the candidates have had some kind of strike patterns or have talked about striking and some extent. But when you look at the fact that we can use strike leverage if we need to, um, it's not something that everyone wants to do, but sometimes it's necessary. So mm -hmm. I think when this contract evolves and we get to the contract negotiating table, we got to send a strong message that, listen, we're going to. We're going to push forward to getting what we want and then moving forward to other people building on that. It's so important. Mm -hmm. So we have not we've not just settled here thinking that the, the vote is over. We've already moved the gears to the next to the next battle. Mm -hmm. Again, did you want to add anything about, you know, starting a caucus in a new union or or connecting it? Oh. I mean, I'm thinking about deer, really. But yeah, I. Uh, I think you've got to you've got to focus on the rank and file membership issues and not come in with a predetermined program. Uh, and some of the issues that we know are here are two-tier agreements. The things that the deer workers, they voted 90% no after the UAW International said vote yes on the contract. Uh, you've got to focus on those kinds of issues. Another thing that we do in TDU, be an educational center. <clears throat> it's not just a matter of opposing the leaders. The number one problem is we don't have enough leaders in the labor movement. We need more people coming up from below. That's what we regard ourselves as. We're an education, networking, sharing movement. We just had our convention 
and, and an experienced labor leader from uh, other union was there. And he said, you know, this is unique. You have rank and file workers, local officers, international officials, all here is like equals, sharing ideas, debating things, discussing things, networking. And to be that kind of a movement, of course, when you're starting out, you're not gonna be at that level, but sort of using that model and not the traditional caucus, here's my 10 point program, vote for me and everyone will be happy. Don't use that model, use more the rank and file movement. Uh, and, and as Carthy said, one critical thing is contracts. And we see that in the UAW too, and UAWD knows it. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I uh, actually am seeing now, I, you know, I invited anyone to let us know if you're from the deer strike. I see we have uh, Brother Jeremy from Local 838 in Waterloo. Um, I think I recognize some other names. I also see we have IATSE members who are, you know, facing this, this contract ratification vote, this big moment we're having. Um, and I also saw someone talking about tier two tier contracts in general, which in a lot of ways is, is kind of the pattern that we've seen as Scott kind of referred to. So I guess, you know, we can move to some closing thoughts and statements, but uh, I think what I really want to hear is, you know, not just advice of how to get started, but what do you see as the signs of life in your union? What gives you some excitement and hope? Can you mention the TDU convention members taking the lead? Where do you see member leadership and how do you kind of throw, throw gasoline at, what do you say, Carthy, that you're like Mighty Mouse going out and right. putting out fires and starting right. stuff. Yes. How do we start more stuff? You know, and what, what are you thinking about? What, what's getting you excited about the labor movement right now and your union and beyond? I'm pretty excited about Sean O'Brien. I think pretty much for me, um, I was pretty excited when I got on board the trail last year and said, man, this guy might change the face of the union. Um, for me, I was one of the discouraged members out there thinking maybe this is it. You know, maybe after 15 years, I'll never see a change in the union. And I got on board um, also TDU and, you know, and said, man, we got to change things. We just got to make that movement more aggressive and more militant, as we would say. Um, so when it comes down to that, I would say for me, I'm energized. I think if we do have a new strong leader who can go out there and advocate for us, we can get behind him and, and lock arms together at the front line and say, this is what we'll, we'll accept and this is what we won't accept. We'll, we'll put a pushback. So for me, I'm excited. I think if anything you can take from TDU here would be definitely the training point. Um, and the organizing strength of the organization. I think that's something we can all use in any, in any unit. So for me, I'm really energized. I went to the TDU convention, the women's convention, the Teamster convention, and really energized to know that people are mobilizing. People are gaining the strength of what, what's ever happening across the country. So I think right now, like I said, it's a critical point for us. And I think if we all get on board and we're all here together as activists to some extent, this is great. This is what we want. We envision this as to have this sort of mobility and be able to talk together and share ideas and come together as one. That's what we want. Yeah. Scott, Mike, Ken, what's, what's uh, keeping you going? What are you excited about? Well, I'm, I'm excited about being able to push our leaders. Uh, you know, that's, that's what this referendum is all about. It's, it's about the ability to push our leaders and, and try and uh, drive the, uh, the direction of our union. Uh, right now, it's, it's uh, you know, it's in, in a, on a crash course. You know, it's headed to uh, self-destruction if we don't correct the course. Um, so to do that, we're, we're working diligently, uh, you know, getting these uh, flyers out. I've got, I'm picking up stickers tomorrow that we can uh, get 100,000 stickers or no, 10,000 stickers uh, uh, passed out around the country. Uh, like I said, we're, we're uh, getting the flyers out. Uh, we have organizers, full-time staff organizers that are helping us and uh, legal fees to deal with, uh, you know, the courts and, and the uh, monitor. You know, the monitor's team is all lawyers, so we need some on our side. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's what's getting me excited is being able to finally have the membership driving this, uh, this ship that uh, is called the UAW, uh, rather than having it being driven off a, a cliff by, uh, you know, people that are self-serving. So uh, UAWD, you can learn more about UAWD at UAWD.org. 
Uh, also, we have a sister website, one member, one vote, one M1V.org, one M1V.org. And, uh, you know, if anybody uh, wants to chip in to help us out, uh, we have a donor box link on our on both of those websites. Great. Thanks, Scott. I mean, uh, feel free, Ken or Mike, to respond to that last question or also, you know, how, how can people find your movement if they are a teamster on this call or no teamsters uh, in their life? Well, right now we're in the midst of an election, as we talked about. That is number one. We're pretty excited about it. We're hopeful. It's certainly not in the bag, but. We, we actually believe that Teamsters United Slate is the favorite and is going to, and is going to win the election and take the leadership of the uh, union out of the hands of the Hoffa administration. And when we talk about strikes, that's the last thing on their mind. They always brag about how much is in the strike fund. And as O'Brien says, that's because you never cause it, call, call any strikes. Uh, and the employers know that. We want to create a union that is that is not just militant, but is inclusive of its members. It's outreaching, that's outreaching to the labor movement and beyond. We can't do it alone. Uh, in TDU, uh, members tend to, when they talk about labor notes, they say, oh, that's the TDU for the whole labor movement. And uh, I put an ad in here, the Labor Notes Conference, March 25, 27. There'll be a lot of Teamsters there. We'll probably be in a good mood. We want to see a lot of other people there because uh, the alternative to having a vision and building a new labor movement is going to be more of what we see in this country. The employers can steal your job and convince you that immigrants did it. We have uh, inequality that's out, off the charts. I live in California. We have more billionaires than anywhere in the world, and I believe we have more homeless also. If you think there's something wrong with that picture, that's what we all should be working on. We're going to do our part in the Teamsters, which can be the most powerful union and hopefully inspire others. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, Mike, did you want to say a few closing words? And I'll, I'll close this out with a few next steps for people because we want to give people something to do, of course. Yeah. Um, what inspires me so much? I mean, I've been around a long time. Um, you know, I've been a, a union rep for 35 years, I go back to the 70s and 80s, um, you know, veteran of many campaigns over, the, over that time. And what inspires me is the, is the young people that I talk to today, the, the people are just getting involved in the UAW or have been around for a few years and have decided to uh, stand up and speak out and advocate for a better union. That just... Uh, brings such so much glow to my to me to just see people uh, willing to do that because in these in these fights you know our biggest enemy is apathy our workers just simply have a tendency to just check out I'm not going to deal with that I can't change it I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste my time with it so when you have people who are inspired to say no we can make it better let's let's work let's give it a try that, that makes me feel so good uh, about the future of labor in this country, without a doubt. Um, in our case, what we're doing here with the uh, referendum, uh, just so people know, when, when Scott made the pitch for a donation, we're mailing tens of thousands of postcards to UAW members and, and retirees. Um, we're emailing 100,000 uh, UAW members and retirees during this, uh, the voting period. We're hand-building at plant gates. We've got days of action plan where we show up at the plant, we, we pass out handbills and whatever. We're phone banking. Uh, we're doing a lot to try to get out our vote, uh, to try to make people aware. Now we have to make people aware because the UAW and the monitor are really not publicizing this referendum at all. So that job is left to us. So, and it takes a lot of money for us to do that. So if you can make a donation, we certainly would appreciate it. If we can post a, the donation link in the chat, if that's permissible, uh, get Scott to do that. And that will help us uh, win this, uh, this fight that we have for democracy in the UAW. But don't give up, continue to believe in unionism, and work towards changing it, making it better. That's, we need to get more people involved on that as well. Uh, because, you know, it's your future. You can't just walk away from this. 
what happens at that bargaining table affects you and your family. And it will for the, your entire working time. So there's no sense of giving up and just you know resigning to the fact, oh, I can't change this. No, get involved, start talking to other people and start co uh, coalescing with folks who feel the same about the same way that you feel about the issues involved in this. And let's work to build a better union. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, uh, definitely, Scott, if you have another, if you wanna uh, put that link again. I also wanna just thank all of our panelists for joining us and for the work you do. I know on top of working a job and organizing a caucus and taking on some of the most powerful union leadership in the country, um, you know, to come spend time with us at Labor Notes uh, is, you know, it, it means a lot to to us at Labor Notes and to the people that we are organizing with. I just want to make sure everyone knows, you know, meetings are great, panels are great. We love to hear from our friends. Uh, doing is is better, and Labor Notes is about organizing. So we, it, you know, like Mike said, it's all about keeping in touch with people, coalescing. Uh, organizing, talking to others. So at Labor Notes, we bring people together for a conference every other year. We'll be having that in the spring. I also want to just drop this link for you all, labornotes.org slash events. We have a ton of online events for every level of activist, organizer, whatever level you're at. You're at. I'll just say you can, you can go there, but I want to plug a couple things. Uh, first of all, if you're in Detroit or Philadelphia, in November and December, we will have in-person troublemaker schools. These are sessions with workshops and trainings, everything from filing grievances to organizing your coworkers, beating apathy at work, like Mike said. Um, I also want to plug, we have a Secrets of a Successful Organizer training every month. There's one in November, one in December. This is for everyone from a new member to a local union president. It's all about how do you do the basics? How do you get people to a union meeting? How do you get people in motion? How do you fight the boss at work? Um, how do you build a labor movement from the bottom up? And I also want to plug our stewards workshops. This is a new event we're doing for union stewards only. I know we have Jeff from John Deere, Local 79. Thank you, Brother Jeff, for coming onto the call. And we would love to see some John Deere workers at some of these events. The whole point here is that we believe that if we connect rank and file members across unions, we can build a labor movement bigger than one workplace and bigger than one contract and bigger than one union. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So thank you all for your uh, attendance. Thank you for um, your support for these Teamsters for a Democratic Union and UAWD organizations. If you are a Teamster or a UAW member, you are sitting on a historic moment. And I hope you will take the opportunity to meet thousands of other activists across the country in these movements um, and stay in touch with Labor Notes. Hope to see you at the convention in 2022. And have a great night, everybody. Thanks.